I don't want to draw Spider-Man, I want to draw my characters. This is what I want to do. I was used to doing uh, superhero cons with a little uh, section of alternative cartoons in their little corner, <laughs> you know. Um, so this was one of the early ones where it was non-superhero uh, comics and more independent. I remember they were saying, this is a new show, this is for alternatives only, and that was kind of rare. I wasn't sure if these would survive because I didn't know if the, the alternative market could support itself, kind of, with something like this. But it seemed real fun and everyone just had a fun time. I graduated from the School of Visual Arts. Some of my classmates told me, you have to go down to Bethesda, you have to go to this small press expo, you're gonna love it. It was an incredible debut to the small press community. I felt so welcomed and made so many friends that first year. And how many years ago was that, 16? The first time I came to SPX, I was either a sophomore or a junior in college. I felt like a child. I was just shaking like a, you know, tiny dog at a parade the entire time because I was just, I wanted to be a part of this world so badly. Here's how it works. You go to SPX, you have your Xerox comic, you might sell a few, you should trade all of them. You should never go home with any. And then the next year, you sell a few more, the ones that you've traded, you now know those people. You just made friends. Feels great because people are coming up to me and saying hi, and um, I get to talk about my friend's work. And it's such an honor, you know? Like, um, it feels like one thing to talk your friends up, but it feels like another thing for people to be sending people to you and actually putting money in your pocket. I was actually just talking to my booth mate about this. Um, it's weird taking money from people because I feel like I'm giving the same amount of money back to other artists. There's this inside joke among cartoonists that we're all just passing the same $5 around over and over again. The thing that I love most about SPX is uh, that every single person behind the table who has made a comic, they made a comic because they love comics and there really isn't much profit motive, or if there is, it's uh, pennies on the dollar kind of stuff. A lot of these cartoonists come and they just trade their work with other cartoonists. And it's, uh, it doesn't always make them rich, but it makes them rich in, in community so you're not afraid to go home and draw, <laughs> you know. So much more exciting oftentimes than what is, you know, being sort of widely distributed or published. It's just people being themselves, being vulnerable publicly and, you know, hoping that you'll be able to meet them where they're asking to be met. love how it feels here and everybody feels like you know them because you read their work and a lot of our work is personal. It just feels like comics camp, I call it. <laughs> when I went to my first SPX and saw these like artisanally handcrafted silk screened comics that were just these amazing labors of love, discounting the time that it took to draw the comic must have taken 30 minutes to bind with all of the stuff that people did to just make their books special, it was very uh, motivating. I think that comics impact culture a lot more than people think. Because when people think of comics, they just think, oh, 
floppies or cape comics or graphic novels, but cartooning infiltrates every single aspect of our lives. Like I was on the subway in New York and I was just looking at my phone and I look up and there's a giant mural by Jillian Tamaki just decorating the subway. Well, most of my stories are coming from my uh, teenage slash college experiences because I think that's the most fun to write about. Jed the Undead is about a friendship between a teenage demon and his human best friend, and they have this kind of codependent relationship. I found that in my own life, my friendships have been a lot more intense than my romances. And I think a lot of that gets overlooked, especially when it comes to male friendships. And when I was going around trying to pitch Jed the Undead, I got told that boys have enough books. And I think that's the exact problem. I think that's why there's toxic masculinity running rampant because there isn't a lot of different role models for teenage boys or young boys to actually look up to that aren't falling into this very specific toxic mold. And you don't have to give up your masculinity to be non-toxic. So I think that's what I'm really trying to explore, just trying to give those kids who are kind of gross, rough around the edges, a little bit masculine, actually something to look forward to that isn't upsetting. As a trans person, I feel like that's kind of important. <laughs> I wanted to talk about high school memories. I wanted to include LGBTQ kids in the story. And when the book was first published, it got challenged. It wasn't being carried in that many stores. I got uninvited to a couple of conferences, but it was so important to me just to be able to see my friends, my community, myself, you know, everybody who I love and, and hold dear, I wanted them to be seen. Even though the book has been banned several times and it ends up on ALA's banned books list every year, it's also getting into kids' hands. And the more attention it gets in a negative light, which I think is ridiculous, the more people buy it, <laughs> which is also a paradox. But when I hear from those kids, I get to talk to them and they thank me for, you know, the fact that they got to see themselves in a story. really glad I didn't listen to anybody who said, oh, this isn't something you really want to do for kids that are that age. Kids can handle it. Kids are ready for it. Kids are looking for themselves in stories. When Fantagraphics published Love and Rockets, it was like Latino voices. It was characters that you felt like could be real. And that started an entire movement of self-publishing, of people who wanted to tell their own stories, people who wanted to see reflections of their communities and themselves. When we started our comic, we wanted to tell stories about our neighborhood. We wanted to talk about people that you didn't see in an everyday comic book or even a TV show or a, or a, um, or a movie even. I was on Twitter and I was tweeting about Lady Bird and how I had been like craving a movie like that since I was a kid. And I was like, I would have loved to see stories like that, but starring um, black and brown what men and women and non-binary kids. Growing up, I love John Hughes movies and I'm from Chicago, so we like are really hard for those. And yeah, like I always wanted to be like the Molly Ringwald and instead I kind of was always like the sassy friend or like some mammy character or, or help. Like black women in film are often seen as to help the story of like the white girls to succeed. There hasn't been those stories yet and it's like 2019 and we're still having firsts. It's just kind of like, oh, we need to change the way media looks right now. One of the elements of racism that's sort of like hard to communicate is that you're not always sure if what you're experiencing is prejudice or you're responding to prejudice or if you're like being too sensitive or, or something like that. Um, so a lot of these things in your black friend that I wrote about, I was like, I felt a lot of nervousness writing about thinking that like maybe I'm overreacting, you know? So there's been a lot of people who I think felt the same way, felt sort of alienated and isolated and frustrated and thought that it was just them. But then we're like, oh no, this is like a response to a social dynamic that is, an, that is like 
uh, ostensibly racist, um, e even if it's not intentional. And that's, that's to me, it's like super touching. I got institutionalized in high school and um, I was like, like politicized in high school. And part of the freedom of that politicization was realizing like, oh, like I'm not an inherently bad person. Uh, I've been put in a situation in which I'm being punished. Um, yeah, and it's like these elements of society are bad. Um, I am not an evil person. I honestly wrote it for black people. Uh, and initially, like some of the people that liked it the most were like sort of more subcultural black people, like, you know, black goths, black punks. But anyway, despite that, yeah, there's a lot of white people that that really got enthusiastic about it, um, felt like it was important. It got it gets taught in some high schools and some colleges. I think like a middle school or two. Um, yeah, they got written about in the New York Times and NPR. White people love NPR, right? <laughs> I remember feeling like there's no room for me in this industry. Like I haven't really seen any comics um, starring black women that isn't Storm or something like that, like indie comics, underground comics. I don't really see that. And, and when I do, sometimes they're very like racially drawn. Like I've seen a lot of that, um, but I haven't seen like myself. And I was like, maybe maybe other black women tried before me and like weren't able to. And that's why it's just, it doesn't exist. It's, nobody wants it. So that's what I would tell myself. I was like, nobody wants this. The comic that I want for is called The Way of Living as a Black Person in America on the Nib. Basically it's a comic about um, personal experience I had with police brutality in Chicago. I was working on some comics at my nine to five and I left my tablet at work and it was Friday night. I was like, oh, I gotta take the train back to work. Um, on my way there, um, there was these three little black boys that were asking for money to take the train home. And they were like 12-ish to 14. Um, so I was like, yeah, no problem. And they were like, yay. So I got ready to swipe my card um, for them to go through and a police officer stopped me. And he was like, um, you know, it's illegal to pay for other people's fare. And I was like, I'm not sure if that's true. And I was like, clearly they, they just want to go home. Like, do you mind if I do this? And like, the officer kept getting very aggressive with me. So I was like, okay, well, if I can't use my pass, can I give them money to like, you know, pay for their own passes? And he's like, do what you want with your money. And I was like, okay. So I go to the machine, get ready to put the money in, and then the officer comes after me again. And he's just like, you know what, I've made that illegal now too. It's now illegal for you to buy somebody else tickets to get on the train. And now at this point, he's like in my face, he's touching me, he's got his hand, his gun. Other officers start to surround me at this platform and I'm like panicking, my, I'm like sweating, I'm like starting to feel myself cry. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not really sure what to do. And he's just like, what decision do you want to make right now? And I'm like, uh, uh, I don't, I think I'm just gonna walk away. And he's like, I think that's the best thing you could do. And like, I didn't want to end up, you know, on the nine o'clock news, like pinned down on the ground or something like that. Um, so I went home and that was end up being my first comic. And that's what shifted my career from being um, the girl who wrote, you know, seven ways to wear a striped t-shirt um, for Hello Gigos to like writing these powerful, more personal narratives that I'm really proud of. It's interesting to um, be celebrated for our traumas as cartoonists, because a lot of us do write about our traumas and yet we're like awarded for these things. It's like a little bit of, I always say comic artists, we like therapize ourselves through our comics, but we should all really go to therapy. I'm afraid sometimes that there is a degree of um, there's a degree of romance that cartooning lends to mental illness. It's it's a medium that lends itself to like uh, lots of exploration and, and lots of frankness. But I think mistaking frankness for uh, processing is a dangerous uh, mistake to make. 
I've met a lot of people who, you know, um, write with great detail about their mental health spills, and I think they produce great comics out of it. But I think you still need therapy. Comics is not ever a replacement for therapy. It's not like something you invite to every, you know, mental party you have. You know, you generally try to keep it off the guest list, but I can't. It's always there. Uh, no matter how much I try and how much older I get, it's always a attendant sometimes sitting right next to me. So I, um, I don't, I really envy those artists and writers who apparently don't suffer that at all. I know plenty of them too. So and I, I've, I've kind of come to the conclusion that if you're wired that way, you're just wired that way. And it's not going to go, it's not going to change. You just have to learn to live with it. Someone came up to me and mentioned a piece that they had bought that I'm not selling anymore called Hereafter, which is about a young man who's uh, dog sitting um, for a couple he grew up with whose son died a long time ago. It's kind of about survivor's guilt, but it slowly morphs into horror. Um, it's a very morose piece. I read it and, uh, and think, oh, the person who wrote this, you know, had things to talk to a therapist about. My new book is called Guts. And this one is about my anxiety trouble. When I was in elementary school, I started having panic attacks and started dealing with phobias and um, anxiety when I was in fourth grade. So I was about nine years old. And it's actually about the same time in my life that I discovered comics. So I found a lot of solace in reading comics at a time in my life that everything felt uncertain and that I didn't know that much about what was going on inside and how it contributed to the way that I felt within my body and just how I was relating to my friends and stuff. So Guts is a double, triple entendre once again to kind of talk about having the courage to face your anxiety and your phobias. I was really not sure if this was a story I could tell because it's kind of gross and it's very personal, but what my readers have taught me is that the more personal, the better. The more personal, somehow the more universal a story becomes. There are a lot of kids out there who are, you know, like me when I was growing up. They're probably not interested in school and academics. They're probably, you know, having a rough time at home and the only thing they've got is books or comics. And I think giving kids the idea that you can grow up, be an adult and still be yourself and manage to do things like make books or, you know, carry on your life is so, so, so important. I mean, someone did it to me and that's why I make comics. So I feel a bit of a sense of responsibility to carry on the torch. I know that there were black women before me who did this. I'm never gonna say I'm the first. Like Jackie Orms is like one of my heroes and she also lived in Chicago. And she's like one of the first not just black, but like female cartoonists. I'm glad that like people can look up to me and be like, I wanna be like you, Bianca, and I wanna do what you do, and you inspire me to tell my story. And I'm like, okay, cause I didn't feel like I had that. So if I can be that for other people, that brings me so much joy. I count myself so lucky to get to do this thing for a living, you know, this strange, bizarre, lovely job that is just me trying to talk to people and me trying to be vulnerable with people and me trying to forge a connection between other people and myself. I want to do right by those people, you know? I want this to be something where they feel taken care of, they feel seen. It just feels good to connect, you know, with the world. You know, a world that knows nothing about what I grew up with. You know, yet there's this connection far away. I've had people write me. I lived in the desert in a camper with my mom, and it was so boring out here, but your comics saved me. It seems like every year, SPX is willing to try new things, 
in the spirit of making the show the best that it possibly can be. Can't hate that, it's awesome. My sense is that a lot of people here, they've known each other far before they met one another's physical form. And I think that that's very cool. The way it's changed is, um, you know, generations change, new generations of cartoonists come up. You know, even if they don't read my comics, they go, oh, there's that guy, <laughs> you know? So it's all fine for me. I'm not as cranky as a lot of older cartoonists about, oh, the young people don't care about us anymore. And so, so it's like, so what? Remember when we were young and we didn't care about the old people? <laughs> People have made a space for me here. People have reached out and let me know that I am welcome here. And I, I can only hope that I have been able to do the same to other people that I sort of see in the position that I was in when I first came here, where you're sort of looking from the other side of the pane of glass and like wanting to, wanting to get in because it is, it is such a special place and it should be, you know, the door should be flung open to everybody because there are so many people right now that are making exemplary, groundbreaking work it's just good people with good hearts and a lot to say, making really beautiful zines in their basement, you know? The spirit of SPX, the heart of SPX to me, has, 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 has always kind of maintained. I see a lot of people of all genders, you know, all races, um, who are sitting behind the table, have their comics, and that's amazing, that's great. Uh, because I'm a fan of comics, and I want it all, and I want every point of view, you know what I mean? Give me chaos, chaos in comics. Now we just have a whole industry that's just people doing what they want to do, doing it their way, and I think that is the best way to do it because that's the only way I knew how to do it when I started. My favorite part is they're doing it without somebody's permission. For me, comics are one of the most exciting and powerful mediums to use for storytelling. It is so easy to make a comic, it is so easy to pick up a comic. And you know, there's obviously widely varying degrees within that, but it is, it's, it's pictures on paper. If you want to put out a story, you need your hands, your heart, a pencil, some paper, maybe some staples. I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, this is a great, great uh, event in the history of SPX. Margie Hamil Huiel is here to go ahead and show us her great documentary about SPX, and, and we're going to do some Q and A about that before we show it. So, Margie, um, tell us about your first. You know, let's get rid of some of the easy stuff. What, what's your film background? What was the purpose for doing this film? Give everybody a flavor for what. What was the genesis of, of this whole project? Sure. I've um, worked in educational media um, in the D.C. area for about 16 years now. So I've worked at um, PBS, National Geographic, Smithsonian, 
And then more recently, I work for um, an organization called Tangle Bank Studios um, based in Bethesda that does science documentary filmmaking. So most of my work has been um, in educational media and it's been in a variety of different um, mediums. So we've done animation, video games, um, and short, short web videos, et cetera. Um, most of my work has been um, typically on the production side. So working on sort of coordinating and finding animators, voice talent, um, boring contract stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and basically in, I guess it was 2019, um, I started to do a documentary studies program to focus more on the medium of documentary through Duke University Center for Documentary Studies program. Um, and we, I needed a final project. And the very first thing that came to mind was SPX. It was sort of, um, you know, I, I knew I might need a plan B, C, and D, but I was sort of hoping that we could just go with plan A and do something on Small Press Expo. It, it was, by the way, that was one of the most fun emails I ever got in my inbox. Yay, was getting good. yours <laughs> about doing a documentary about us. So how, like, how long have you been coming to SPX? Give us some background about your interaction with SPX prior to um, coming up with this absolutely brilliant idea. Thank you. Um, yeah, I came, we moved to the DC area um, in 2006. So I came here because I uh, dropped out of a graduate program to take a really great job at public broadcasting. And I worked very closely with the sort of like PBS kids team. So there were a lot of SPX fans there already. Um, and when they told me about it, I, I kind of couldn't believe it. I had been a huge fan of indie comics um, for my um, entire life. And I think starting around 12 years old. So that's um, 1988. So finding um, these types of comics was a real, um, you know, it was sort of a full-time kind of job or hobby for, for a kid to, to have and do. Um, and so when people started telling me about what I would see in SPX, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't get over the fact that every, everything was going to be in one room. Um, I'd not been used to meeting authors before. I still am like too shy to get them to sign um, my stuff because they're, um, for me, comic book creators are probably the one type of, in my world, celebrity <laughs> that I'm just too nervous around. I'm very starstruck, um, which made interviewing um, a lot of those stars kind of uh, interesting um, for the documentary. But but yeah, I, I started coming in 2006. Um, I missed one year because I got married, but for the most part, we do try to go back every single year. Um, and it typically does coincide with my anniversary, which is which is great. It's perfect because it's um, it's just a singular kind of event. And fantastic. Now you've done at least one comic, haven't you? Tell tell us how you came to be one of many independent comic uh, artists and creators. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, comics are like that. If you're um, if you're a reader and a fan, you start craving um, being a creator pretty quickly. Um, and I was there with one of my colleagues at PBS at the time, and she just kind of said it out loud, you know, this, this thought that was very hidden um, from, from myself, which was, she was like, I, I want to make comic book. Um, and I thought, well, shoot, yeah, I do too. Ah. <laughs> what a great, can you just do that? And that's kind of the great thing about SPX is that it's filled with people that do, in fact, just do that. They, they have that idea to, to put that story together. Um, and so I started thinking about my concept um, around, it was around 2008 when I had what really felt like a dream job at the time. Um, and that was, I think, when the world kind of started falling apart, at least from my perspective, in terms of um, financial markets crashing and, um, you know, housing markets crashing, and there was all this uncertainty. Um, and at least for me, I started really thinking about um, just kind of looking around and just thinking like who like who's in charge right because everything is is a complete mess um and that really coincided a lot for me at least with a lot of um thinking about my early upbringing as a kid and sort of a very um patriarchal way that i grew up um so that was when my you know comic idea came up and it came i think we first boothed in 2011 and then um subsequently in 2012. And I think that um, that experience was great because I boosted at a couple of other um, 
you know, conferences that might be considered peer conferences to Small Press Expo, but I think that it was what convinced me that there really isn't a peer conference. So I had a really great time exhibiting at MOCA um, and Alternative Press Expo in the in the Bay Area, um, but uh, you know, it was um, the fact that SPX was kind of the home conference made me realize just how special um, that access was. And and it's very interesting that your documentary. The perspective of it is not of the art, but of the diversity within SPX. Can you tell us how you came to that particular approach to documenting the SPX community? Yeah, I mean, the way that I sort of um, went into it is, you know, I wanted it certainly to be kind of driven by by the creators. Um, and so I had a list of questions that were very creator specific for, for everyone that I talked to. Um, and through those interviews and conversations, I guess, you know, for lack of a more elegant way to put it, that was really the story that had emerged. It was this idea of people talking about wanting to see themselves um, in stories, wanting to see themselves in media and feeling kind of otherwise invisible. Um, obviously that, you know, that was something that had resonated for me as well. I think one of the things that um, kind of threw me off a little bit when I was boothing my, my comic was that um, a, a young man came up maybe on the Sunday after he had purchased my comic on Saturday and he was a little shaken up and he was like, I never read a book with like, a woman protagonist before and I was like oh you know and I'm, I'm like you know I hope you enjoyed it and he's like yeah I really related to it I didn't really expect that <laughs> and huh. I didn't really know how to take that either but I was a little bit um I I didn't expect to hear that either it didn't occur to me that um that there were men that didn't read um from you know books from a female point of view I also didn't really you know think about it as a female point of view I just was writing it as a disgruntled office worker um and that was the point of view that I thought I was conveying so that definitely got me thinking about how low stakes it is to enter um from someone else's perspective when you are buying um comics because um, you know, they, they are so accessible and affordable, you can really try something new. And I was really happy that this young man did so. Um, but it also just made me think about how um, in, in, you know, sort of mainstream media, it's really, um, you don't get that chance to kind of cross, cross pollinate and, and see from other people's points of view. So that was obviously something that had resonated quite a bit with me. And so hearing it, um, back from the authors that I talked to and the creators that I talked to 10 years later, I thought, wow, there's really, there's really something magic that happens here. And um, how many different creators did, did you interview for the, the documentary? I think in total there were about 14. And so that was definitely um, the worst part of this process was having to sort of tighten the story up and, and you know, make, um, make cuts in terms of um, trying to tell, you know, a coherent story. So it's something that I would absolutely love to revisit is to try to find some maybe shorter um, pieces to bring in all the creators. And uh, it's very interesting because obviously I've seen the documentary. Um, it, it is interesting, the diversity of people and the diversity of whether it's sexual orientation or race or what have you that comes out in the documentary. Yeah, absolutely. And I know, you know, um, that was certainly we're talking um, to you prior to the documentary and absolutely talking um, to Rob, Rob Clough, who directs the programming, hearing the sort of um, the, the, the work and the kind of deliberate nature and the attentiveness that the SPX board brings to who they invite to the table, I think was another thing that made me think um, quite a bit about the fact that this isn't accidental. This is this is very um, intentional work to bring all these voices um, to Small Press Expo. And it's something that, you know, I um, in thinking about distributing this film more broadly, would love for other conference organizers to kind of learn from, because I think, um, again, SPX does a, a incredible job um, at doing that. We're we're especially proud of our uh, of our diversity, and yes, it, it 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 has. There have been more than one executive committee um, meeting where we've said, "Okay, how good are we doing with 
showing the true diversity of comics out there. And so uh, it was it was really interesting to see that perspective come out in the documentary. Now, you were able to uh, actually talk to um, people like Chris Ware and Raina Telgemeier and then Bianca Zuniz and, you know, uh, Jaime Hernandez is actually is given quite a bit of, of uh, airtime in this particular documentary. Um, what plans do you have for the unedited um, the unedited interviews that you did? Yeah, that's something that um, I, I'm sort of wide open and, and hoping to continue a dialogue with SPX about what the best way is to get that um, to the people that are, are going to um, appreciate it the most. So, you know, we do we have all that footage. Um, we have we continue to have amazing B-roll. You know, to your point about the diversity of of um, creators that are represented at SPX, that's something that I heard from people that were at the 25th anniversary in 2019 who hadn't been to a small press expo in 10, 15 years um, to kind of say that they noticed that difference and how much they appreciate it and how much they are noticing that reflected in the quality of, of what's at at the booths. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, kind, you know, that footage from the people that, that are attendees. Um, there are some great interviews of creators on the floor um, that didn't make it in. Um, just for very sort of practical kind of production and, and um, storytelling reasons. So um, for all of that, I, you know, I, I'm hoping that we um, can continue to have a conversation about how to make that available. Oh, we, we will make it available. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So uh, what was it that surprised you the most about the interviews that you did? W w was there any one person or one theme that really came through to you? I think, um, I don't know if surprise me is the right word, but the thing that made an impression on me and that I've been really learning through this work is, um, you know, there's sort of this idea out there that there are kind of multiple ways of, of, of being intelligent. So you can be very analytical. Um, you know, you can be very intelligent interpersonally in terms of forming good relationships. The thing that surprises me when I talk about artists is the, the sort of depth of intrapersonal intelligence that these individuals have. The, um, that level of knowing yourself um, is something that I think is unique in, in artists and incredible, you know, especially noticeable with um, comics artists because they have to be master um, craftspeople of so many different types of arts in terms of design, you know, illustration, storytelling, writing, etc. Um, and it's the sort of thing where, you know, I think about it a lot, especially when you kind of look at what's going on in the world right now. Um, that that is just something that I feel like if more people spent time cultivating that in themselves, I really think the world would be a better place. I mean, the extent of self knowledge that these um, creators have and their ability to use that to understand the world in this very compassionate and vulnerable way um, is 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 incredible. It's sort of like Richard Feynman doing physics. You know, it's right. um, just truly masterful to see them. Um, you know, share that during the interviews. Yeah, and the other thing that's interesting about the interviews is um, how much they all credited SPX with, um, you know, with, with the degree of art and the degree of diversity and things like that. And that was pretty much unsolicited. It was totally unsolicited. Um, it was totally unsolicited and it, it came through to me and I, you know, which, um, I think I had a little bit of a blind or two because I'm like, yeah, of course, this place is amazing. And of course, we're having a great time. But what I'm hearing from people, and this is people who have nothing to do with comics and people who are really into comics, is that they were like, oh, my gosh, the joy. You know, that's what strikes people, I think, when they watch this is that they can really tell the joy. They feel like everyone that the fact that everyone is so happy to be there um, is infectious. And people are like, you know, ask me, they're like, OK, when is this? where is this i have to go to this thing you know i have to bring my friends i have to bring my kids um you know people are are there are a lot of people that are like how how did i not even know about this um so yeah it's been doing really great work for i think conveying that sort of excitement um and again just kind of happiness that the place feels and i think especially um because it's been two years i feel like um 
it to me at least i've seen this so many times but every time i see it it sort of tugs at my heart a little bit more i can't wait to go back and uh T tell us, what are your plans for entering the documentary into various film festivals? Yeah, we've been um, at a few. So we um, premiered at Woods Hole in uh, Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Um, they did a hybrid festival, which was very exciting and cool. Um, we are at DC Shorts on um, this Friday, um, which is also a hybrid festival. We've been at Out South um, in Durham. We um, have been in Summer in the South in Atlanta. Um, we just got into another one um, in Atlanta. So yeah, we've it, we've been doing pretty well for um, for kind of a scrappy project with an admittedly sort of awkward time of, of 24 minutes and four seconds um I, I really should have tried to get it under 20 minutes but all the cuts that i made were already too painful to bear so um so yeah we've definitely been getting um really great responses from the festival circuit so far fantastic are there any, are there any more that are coming up um let me think yeah I, I, the one in atlanta um and i can't remember the name of it which is terrible um, is, is in October, um, and then September is kind of a big month for a lot of festivals, so hopefully we'll hear um, more soon. And, and how many festivals have you submitted to which you haven't heard back yet? Um, oh, there's there's a good, there's like at least 30 oh. <laughs> that we're waiting for. <laughs> now it goes through, um, like I think April 22 is my last um, hear from date, so the arc on these is really long. Um, you know, we've definitely got some um, uh, some some long shots in there, but I think we have a lot that um, you know really will play on on the themes of of this documentary that I think we'll be able to find an audience. So yeah, so I'm hoping we'll we'll you know see at least a dozen more coming in the in the pipe. That, that is that is just fabulous. And um, Margie, um, first of all, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, like I said at the beginning, yours was one of the most pleasurable emails that I've ever received. And I was really happy to be able to help you pull a whole bunch of stuff together in order to make it happen. I'll never forget when you were in, when we went into the room, you could do the recording and it was an echo chamber. Yes. <laughs> and, and we pulled all the, all the quilts and, and stuff off the beds <laughs> and put them on the floors and were able to deaden the sound enough so you could record. That was, that was, ve that was very interesting. And why don't you tell everybody real quick, you know, just some of the names that are in the, in this documentary. Sure. Yeah. So we, um, as, as you mentioned, Warren, we've got Jaime Hernandez. We have, um, uh, um, Bianca Yunus. We have, um, Ben Passmore. We have Ed Pisker. We have, um, um, Casimir Iskander. We have, um, uh, let's see who else. I'm doing I'm, I'm trying to go through chronologically um rosemary o'connell valerio we have um we have chris ware we have reina um who am i missing warren i i, I think you covered <laughs> it all at that okay. point you know it much better than i do but yeah and, and especially getting people like reina and chris ware as as part of the the group, given their given their relative stature in the quote unquote mainstream world, as opposed to the indie comics world, that 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 shows how how well our stature is. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, hearing Raina talk about her, you know, first booth sixteen years ago with her floppies, and then now, um, you know, her huge success, um, you know, publishing with Scholastic. That's certainly the one that my, a lot of my friends, cause they've, a lot of them have kids now that are reading her stuff. So that's the one that catches me the most um, sort of cultural capital <laughs> with my friends. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Margie, I, we can't thank you enough for, for the documentary. Uh, everyone be prepared. This is like a ton of fun if you're an SPX person. Even if you're not, it's a ton of fun. Thanks so much, Warren.